On November 11th, 1939, the Centenary Gentlemen of Centenary College in Shreveport, Louisiana, squared off against the Texas Tech Red Raiders in what is remembered as the craziest game in college football history. The match would go on to set 13 NCAA records, despite the fact that it ended in a scoreless tie. It was the fourth rainiest day of the year in Louisiana, and the field became a huge mud patch with traditional offense ineffective at best and dangerous at worst due to injuries and turnovers, of which there were many. The best option for gaining field position was to punt and hope that the returner fumbled the ball. And so both teams went all in on this strategy, and they punted a combined total of 77 times. 67 of those times came on first down. And during one stretch in the second half, there were 22 punts in a row. The game ended with 30 yards of total offense for both teams. Centenary had 31 yards, and Texas Tech had negative one uh, offensive yards, and it was a 0-0 score. If Governor Felix in our text tonight had played football, he would have been a punter. Throughout his story, he is unwilling to make final decisions, not because he's unable or has decision fatigue or anything like that, but because we'll find that he lived his life playing games. He played games in his career. He played games in his marriage. Often he played games with people's lives. He was constantly involving himself in schemes to get what he wanted, despite the risks and the potential for disaster. All along, the most dangerous game that he was playing was with his own eternal soul. The passage tonight has a lot to say about how gracious God is and it gives we Christians here encouragement about never giving up hope for lost individuals around us. But most of all, this is a passage of scripture for those who do not believe. This is a cautionary tale, an urgent warning for you about the game you're playing and the judgment that you faced if you will not accept Jesus Christ's free offer of salvation. Now, when we last left off, Felix had been serving as a judge Paul had been brought before him in the city of Caesarea, and he had just heard testimony against Paul, and then he heard Paul's defense. And we pick back up back in verse 22 of chapter 24. It says, Since Felix was well informed about the way, he adjourned the hearing, saying, When Lysias the commander comes down, I will decide your case. From the start, we're going to see that Felix loves to play the waiting game. It becomes very obvious Yet yeah, he doesn't believe any of the charges that have been brought against Paul. He didn't think he was an insurrectionist. He didn't think that he tried to defile the Jewish temple. He didn't think any of that. But Felix wasn't interested in justice. He was interested in his position. He doesn't want to agitate the Jewish leaders, so he punts. There's no need to have Lysias come down to Caesarea. Lysias had already sent an official statement giving his opinion of Paul's innocence. We saw it a passage or two ago where he says, hey, this Lysias, the commander of the garrison, he said, this is what's going on. This is what I think. This guy didn't do anything wrong, but I'm sending him to you because they were trying to assassinate him. So there's absolutely no need to have Lysias come down. Now, some scholars believe the text should read like this. When Lysias comes down, I can become more informed about the way and I will decide the case. That might be what he said, but it seems hardly believable that he, as governor of the region, did not have some understanding of Christianity. After all, he had been posted there for five or six years. The whole Roman world was being saturated by this teaching about Jesus. And in Caesarea, the town, the city where they are, in Caesarea, there had not only been an established Christian church for 25 years, but one of the most prominent centurions in the city was a devout, spirit-filled believer, Cornelius. We met him a long time ago in these studies. We also note that there's no indication Lysias ever came or was ever even sent for. So Felix was just trying to buy himself time. Verse 23, he ordered that the centurion keep Paul under guard, though he could have some freedom, and that he should not prevent any of his friends from meeting his needs. Felix didn't think Paul was a flight risk, and it's clear he didn't think he was going to incite violence if his friends were allowed to visit him. Now, as an aside, 
It's very unlikely that Cornelius would have been the centurion referenced here. I suppose it's possible. But church historians do record and point out that the second bishop in the church at Caesarea was named Cornelius. Now, we don't know if that's the same guy that we read about earlier in the book of Acts, uh, but we can be confident that even if Cornelius didn't retire from the military and become the overseer of the church there, even if that wasn't him, if it was some other Cornelius, we can be sure that the centurion Cornelius uh, in his years in the Roman army and his years in that city would have led to other Christians both in and out of uniform. He was a godly man who was full of the spirit. The one time we saw him, he was bringing people to hear the message of Peter. And so he had this heart for evangelism. And so it'd be interesting to know just how much of an influence he had in the city. We've seen before that Paul was usually the one caring for his friends. On his missionary journeys, he not only worked to support himself, but those who traveled with him. But now we see things are different. God has allowed this season in his life where he's going to be shackled to a Roman soldier around the clock, and there will be a lot less movement and activity than he'd been used to for quite some years. And now it would be his friends who take care of him. As an application for us as Christians, we want to be growing in our sensitivity to the needs of the Christians around us. In our culture, we sometimes have this weird issue where we really need help, but we don't want to ask anyone for help. And it seems that the more we need, the less we ask for it. If you need help, come to your spiritual brothers and sisters. And if you see someone in the spiritual family of Christ who's in need, then seek the Lord and pray and try to find a way to be a part of meeting that need. Verse 24 says, several days later, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and listened to him on the subject of faith in Christ Jesus. For 20 years, there has been an annual auction held on eBay uh, to benefit a San Francisco charity. The item being bid on each year is a power lunch with Warren Buffett. Okay, this happens every single year. In 2019, the lunch set a record. It sold for $4.5 million. Now, if you can afford a lunch like that, I'm not sure if you really need the Oracle of Omaha's advice, right? It seems like you've already got it figured out, Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Now, listen, we may think, man, it would be really cool to have a lunch with Warren Buffett. Eh, Who wants to have lunch with Warren Buffett? But insert somebody that you think is great in that category. But what an amazing sit down this couple had with the great apostle, with Paul, a a, a private audience with him. Uh, Amazing. Just the three of them, maybe a soldier hanging around in the background. And they came in and they said, so tell us about Jesus. This is an amazing biblical moment. Now, before we get to that, let me tell you about this couple. Drusilla was part of the Herodian family. Her great grandfather was the one who tried to kill baby Jesus in Bethlehem. Her great uncle was the one who killed John the Baptist. Her father was the one who killed James, the brother of John, and then received worship and was struck dead by God in Caesarea, by the way. Shortly before this passage, she had been married to a foreign king. Uh, She'd been sent over there, married to this other king. But Felix had convinced her to leave him and become his third wife. Now, Felix, if we've forgotten, was not just a procrastinator. He was also a deeply corrupt man. He hired assassins to kill the high priest, Jonathan. One source describes the region during his term of office as being practically anarchy, a time of just violence and corruption and instability all around. Now, what does their meeting with Paul show us? What does their desire to meet with him show us? For one thing, it shows us that even deeply secular people have an eternal hunger that maybe they don't even understand. And why is that? Bible explains it. The Bible says that God has placed eternity in our hearts, not just in the hearts of Christians or people who are interested in spiritual things. God has placed eternity in the heart of every single human being so that they would long for him and yearn for him. Felix had been a slave early in his life. He later became what was known as a freed man. And he had somehow clawed his way all the way from slave to governor. He had power and position and wealth. He got the prettiest girl, stole her from a king even. And yet, despite all he had, 
all that he had scratched out for himself against all odds, there was this other itch that he just couldn't scratch. There was this question that he just couldn't answer deep inside of his heart. There was this emptiness inside of him that he couldn't avoid. He could try to uh, mute it and silence it and push it out of his mind. But there in the quiet of his heart, he knew that he was in need. It was deep down, but they're all the same. What could this poor preacher have to say? This guy who's probably still black and blue from the beating he'd received from an angry mob in Jerusalem, what could he have to offer? And yet Paul was so full of hope and so full of peace and so full of the, of the Holy Spirit of God that Felix and Drusilla decided they must hear what he had to say. These were not the kind of people who filled their days with spiritual things. Felix and Drusilla weren't heading down to the library in Caesarea and say, let's read the Jewish scriptures a lot to each other. And yet there was something that drew them. This guy might know something, something that can speak to the deepest part of our lives, something that can address that lack that we have. Maybe they'd heard the stories about this man, Paul, about how wherever he went, cities were turned upside down, lives were changed, miracles were happening. Maybe they heard that this man had seen the risen Christ himself spoken to him face to face. And so they wanted to hear what he have, had to say. What did he have to say? Verse 25. Now, as Paul spoke about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became afraid. And he replied, leave for now, but when I have an opportunity, I'll call for you. Paul didn't just speak in abstract terms about God as, as an abstract being. He didn't speak even just abstract terms about the Lord Jesus. I'm sure he talked to them, of course, about who Jesus is and the story of his birth and death and resurrection, but it's clear he made it a point to speak to them directly about how the truth of the gospel was not just something that lived out there in the atmosphere, but that it was going to impact their lives and their future. This was a, a math problem that they were part of, this message of the gospel. He talked to them about righteousness and self-control and judgment to come. And when we break this down and, and really think about it for a minute, what we come to discover is that Christianity is a comprehensive theology. It deals with the past, the present, and the future. Listen, it's not enough for a person to try to be good today. We live in the present. We can't live in the past. We can't live in the future. We live in the present. We are bound by time and space. That's why there's so many books and movies and all these things about time travel, because we like to imagine what would it be like to go back and correct the wrongs? What would it be like to go forward and see what's happened and all those sorts of things? But we live in the present. But Christianity first primarily or first in your life deals with the past. It's not enough for a person to try to be good today because even if you're good today, that can't make a person truly righteous. That's the first thing that Paul talked to them about, righteousness. What is righteousness? It means being right before God. It means God looks at you and says, you're good to go. You're good to enter into heaven. And trying to be a good person right now cannot possibly wipe out the guilt of all the sins and all the imperfections of your past. You have them, I have them, we all have them. If you wanna walk through death and be granted entrance into heaven on the other side of death, well, that requires righteousness. You must be perfectly holy in every way, just as God is holy. You can't have made one mistake. You can't have told one lie. You can't have taken one grain of salt that wasn't yours. You can't have had one envious thought. That seems unfair. Well, think about it this way. Let's say you were trying to compete in the Tour de France and they hauled you in for a drug test right before and they found trace amounts of HGH in your system, just a little bit. It's just a little bit of HGH in my system. You'd be thrown out, you'd be disqualified. You'd have no place in the race. You'd not even be allowed to compete. It wouldn't matter if the guy next to you had more HGH in his system than you. It wouldn't matter if you said, well, sure, I took a little dose of HGH, but I wasn't blood doping, so that's okay, right? It wouldn't matter. You're guilty, you're ineligible to even put yourself in the race. You'd be tossed out in shame and you'd be disqualified. And they say, and you can never race again, right? That's what happened to guys like Lance Armstrong once they're found out. 
So Paul looked at this couple who cheated and killed and lied so often in their personal lives and their public lives, and he told them the hard truth. If you are not righteous, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said it plain as day. He would have told them about how as a Pharisee, he lived his, this life as a Pharisee before he was a Christian, and that in that phase of his life, he dedicated his entire existence to living a righteous life, and he would have said, and I couldn't do it. I got closer than anybody else has ever gotten apart from Jesus who lived a perfect sinless life. Paul's like, I was the guy, I was the Pharisee among the Pharisees. No one got closer and I wasn't even on the same continent as God's righteousness. I was so far removed. I was so wicked inside. I was so imperfect. I was so ruined by sin. He would have told them that there is none righteous, no, not one that they were sinners and that the wages of sin is death. That's bad news. So their past condemned them. Well, then what about today? He would have moved on to the right now. He says, okay, well, let's pause on righteousness for a minute. Why don't we talk about self-control? Paul preached to them about self-control. I imagine the soldier in the background chuckled to himself as Paul talked to this man and this woman about dying to self and selflessness and bringing their wicked hearts under dominion. Now, the fact that they had called this meeting, they asked for this meeting. Paul didn't, they did. And that reveals that they knew that they were lacking something. They felt something was wrong inside and they were right. They had everything that they wanted, but inside it was never enough. They always craved more. Look at Felix. He always wanted more money. He always wanted a new wife. He always wanted a different situation. He always wanted more no matter what he got. Day after day, they found themselves giving in to wicked desires and the worst parts of themselves. Even if they had wanted to do the right thing, they couldn't do it. They couldn't control themselves. The historian Tacitus wrote that Felix, quote, practiced every kind of cruelty and lust. And of course, Drusilla was no better. They might rule a region, but they had no control over their own hearts. They were ruled by their cravings. They were ruled by their circumstances. Paul would have shared with them about how he had the same struggle before he was born again. He talks about it in the book of Romans. He's like, man, those things I wanted to do, I didn't do. Those things I didn't want to do, that's what I was found doing. Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Now that Paul had been saved from that body of death, everything was different. He was content in any circumstance. This is the guy that can sing in a dungeon after being beaten with rods and fastened in stocks. He still had temptations to contend with, of course, but now those temptations could not overcome him anymore because he was full of God, the Holy Spirit. And God will never allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to stand against, the Bible declares. Now, instead of being empty, God had filled him with joy and purpose and the ability to do what was good rather than to be ruined by his own bad choices. Paul preached to this couple about the judgment to come, moving into the future now. A man like Felix, he had to worry every single day that his sins would find him out. He had to worry every time the mail came. I don't know if perhaps you've ever had a time in your life where you're, you were expecting a bad piece of mail, maybe a bill you couldn't pay or the you know, past due notice or the whatever in the mail. And this was the kind of life that Felix would have had to live. That every day the messenger was going to come and say, Caesar has recalled you because he knows what you're doing. Because Felix lived a life of sin. He lived a life of selfishness and self-indulgence. He's having people killed. He's robbing people. He's starting all of these problems. He's doing all of these weird politic games to move himself forward in his career and push others down. And so he has to live in fear that he's going to be judged by his Caesar, that he was going to receive that summons to stand before the emperor, because of some corrupt thing he'd done. Well, Paul explained that Felix didn't even know the half of it. You're worried about Caesar Nero? Oh, buddy, you got a way bigger problem than Caesar Nero. Paul told him, one day you're gonna stand before the king of all kings and you have no defense, no defense whatsoever. And there's no advocate for you. If you enter into eternity without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you, you enter heaven's courtroom with no attorney, no advocate, no substitute, no help, just you. 
standing before the thrice holy God who says, did you accept my son? No. Are you perfect? No. That's it. And it's all over. You see, standing before the king of all kings, Paul would have explained to Felix, this is what would be said. You've wronged the king of kings. You've blasphemed him. You've committed constant acts of treason against him. You're going to be judged. You see, Christian theology isn't just about some present feeling that we have. It's not like transcendental meditation. People talk about that sometimes where, you know, I just go through some thoughts and a mantra and this, you know, this discipline in the morning so that I can have a more restful day and have lower blood pressure, right? Christianity is much more than that. Christianity says, hey, why don't we zoom all the way into your heart and zoom all the way out outside of time and space? Why don't we deal with the past, present, and future? Why don't we deal with you from the inside out? Not just you know, things you're thinking, but let's deal with the actual nature of sin that you have inherited from your parents and the individual acts of sin. Why don't we deal with the heart of hearts, which is desperately wicked, that only God can discern between the soul and the spirit and only God can know the deepest part of man. He says, why don't we deal with that? And why don't I give you a new heart and a new mind and a new life and a new path to walk? That empty spot, why don't I fill it? This is what Paul talked to them about when they said, why don't you tell us about faith in Christ? You see, the days of this life are a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. Christ came that we might have life everlasting. He lived a perfect life, died on a Roman cross, rose again the third day in order to pay the debt that we each owe. That's why Christ died. Christ died because you owe a debt and I owe a debt. Every single human being owes a debt to the holy God because we've wronged him. And the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus Christ, who is God, came from heaven to earth in what we call in the Bible, the incarnation, God put on human flesh. And he said, I will live a sinless, perfect, righteous life. And then I will willingly choose to die and receive the punishment that each of you and me deserve. And then anyone who wants in on that arrangement can be in on it. He paid the debt that he didn't owe because we owed a debt that we cannot pay. And now because of his work, because of his substitute, he then turns around and looks at us and he says, now I'm offering you this as a free gift, which is able to cleanse us of our guilt and give us power for living today and the hope of heaven. Jesus Christ deals with the sins and mistakes and guilt of our past. He deals with our life today, giving us powerful living so that we can move through this life actually having purpose, actually being filled, actually having all of these things that he's promised to his people. And then best of all, he says, I've opened the door to eternity for you so that you can live with me forever in perfect glory in heaven. You can be saved from the guilt of your sin because God does not want anyone to perish, but for all of them to come to repentance so that they can be forever with him in heaven. That's the deal. They said, tell us about Christ at this meeting. And Paul responded by explaining how through faith in Jesus, we are declared righteous. All our past is dealt with. We are indwelled by the spirit of God to empower us to live a transformed, self-controlled life and how he finished our judgment at the cross. Jesus Christ said, it is finished. The debt's paid. Judgment is over for those who are in Christ. Now we look forward not to the judgment seat of Christ as Christians, we look forward to the reward seat of Christ. There is still a judgment for those who will not accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. They will stand before the white throne judgment and there'll be no hope for them. But there's hope right now for anyone who will call on the name of the Lord and will receive him as Lord and King who will acknowledge what he did and receive his free gift of salvation. We see that Paul's message hit its mark in Felix's heart. He was convicted. He, he realized the trouble he was in. He was trembling. But in that moment of fear, he made one more choice. You know, we imagine, you know, if you watch the, the Super Bowl, right, this past Sunday, I don't follow football, but I, I gather it was a pretty lame game. <laughs> we saw a little bit of it. It was on some TV in the background. And as the clock's winding down, you know, the team that who lost? 
<laughs> Which, who's the team that lost? Kansas City? Yes. All right. The clock's winding down. It's over, right? It's over. They can't win. But they have to make some play. And so they're calling their plays. They're doing whatever they can. Trying these, you know, crazy passes and trying all these different things. But it's over. They might as well just walk off the field. But they play a few more plays. And so Felix is at this moment and he realizes it's over. I've lost. What am I going to do? And he makes one more move here, one more play that he's trying to wrestle back, you know, his heart from this situation. And so he, instead of surrendering, rallies his troops and retreated. Big difference between retreating and surrendering. You see, God tells us that we are at war with him before we're Christians, but that he has come with terms of peace. He wants to make peace with human beings. He says, you're at war with me, but I wanna be at peace with you. But you have to surrender. You have to lay down your weapons. You have to lay down your arms. You have to abandon that old kingdom that you're part of, the kingdom of darkness, the Bible calls it. He says, and join me. Join me, join my ranks. And instead of surrendering Felix, he retreated. He took another turn in the waiting game. Leave for now. When I have an opportunity, I'll call you. You had an opportunity. You're taking it right now. You're right there talking to them. What better opportunity is there? Maybe someone listening here tonight has been playing this game with God. You feel that tugging in your heart. You feel the weight of your sin. You know something's not right. Or at least you have felt that at some point, but you keep punting, you keep punting, you keep putting it off. One of these days, I'll get right with God. You know, it's been said, one of these days is really none of these days. And the truth is, you don't know if you're gonna make it home tonight. We don't know who's making it home tonight. I hope everybody makes it home. But if we're actually honest, we don't know if all, every one of us is gonna make it home tonight especially during this time with the pandemic and COVID, probably all of us either know people or know of people who they were fine on Monday, they were dead on Saturday, right? People who you thought, whoa, what? How did that happen? You don't know, I don't know. I really hope everybody makes it home and has a wonderful restful evening, but you might not. Are you ready to face the judge of heaven and earth? Are you ready to stand before him? Have you been granted access into heaven? because there's only two destinations after a person passes through death, heaven and hell. There's no other option. There is no purgatory. There is no soul sleep. There is no annihilation. The Bible's very clear. Jesus spoke about hell more than anyone. He said, look, there's two options. There's life and there's death. And just as life is eternal on the other side of time, death is also eternal. That's not what God wants for you. We don't know if we're gonna make it home tonight. You don't know if cancer is growing undetected in your body right now. God says in his word, don't hear this marvelous gift of God's kindness and grace and then ignore it. It says now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. The Philippian jailer, jailer a number of passages ago, he was confronted with his sin and his guilt. What did he do? He didn't retreat. He surrendered. He fell on his knees before Paul and he said, what must I do to be saved? And if you happen to be wondering the same thing right now, listening to this, this is the answer. It's very simple. It's very clear. This is what the Bible says. You want to be saved? This is how. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The Bible says all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saving faith as revealed in the Bible includes not only, well, I, I will choose to believe that Jesus Christ was a real historical figure, he was, but it's not only believing that Jesus is God and Lord and Savior, that he died on a cross to, to die in your place and that three days later he rose again. You must believe that to be saved. But in the Bible, belief also includes that surrender, that what the Bible calls repentance. That means turning from your old life, turning from your sin and saying, you know, God, I've been going the other way all this time. I've been spitting in your face and I've been ignoring you. I've been 
going my own way through life and I'm going to stop doing that and I'm gonna turn towards you and go with you. I don't know all the answers about you. I don't have you know, everything I need to know about you yet, but I know enough to know that you're real and you love me and I want to follow you. When Jesus would walk up to people and invite them to become his disciples, he said, follow me. They didn't know all the answers. They didn't have all the information yet, but they could make a choice. Would they surrender and join him? And many did, and lots did it. If you're wondering how to be saved tonight, that's how. If you will call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Turn from your sin. Agree with God that sin is what has separated you from him. And in that belief and agreement, you make the choice to turn away from your sin and instead embrace the love of God that is being offered to you. Felix wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. And he missed out big time. It was the greatest, most valuable moment of his life, and he missed it. Maybe you heard about the British man uh, who was in the news recently. He accidentally threw out a hard drive containing $270 million worth of Bitcoin. <laughs> if he had that hard drive, he could sell the Bitcoin, even though it's pretend, and he could have $270 million right now. But he threw it out. What a horrifying mistake. Somebody needs to like, they need to have somebody with him at all times doing a check the welfare. Are you okay, buddy? But he made this horrible mistake, right? He didn't mean to do it, but he did it all the same. Now, Felix was making the biggest mistake of his life, not on accident, but because he was unwilling to die to himself. So he stuffed those feelings down. He drowned them out with the same old earthly things that he always gave into. Look at verse 26. At the same time, he was also hoping that Paul would offer him money. So he sent for him quite often and conversed with him. Not only is this immensely sad, it shows us how Felix was trapped in this cycle of sin and bad choices. Trapped because he kept himself in that cage. He kept himself in that cycle. He had that moment where his heart realized, man, what this guy is telling me is true. I should escape this life of sin that I'm in. He's shown me how I can. It's a free gift from God being offered to me. And instead he said, no, I'll stay in my cage. I'll stay in the dark. And that's an immensely sad thing. You know, though things were more lax out in the provinces, Roman law did not look kindly on, on taking of bribes. In fact, if he was found out as a person who took bribes, he would be punished by exile and confiscation of property. He's running a big risk here, but he was running the risk hoping to get a few extra bucks. And what did he trade? Well, what's an eternal soul worth? He traded his priceless soul. He traded an eternity in heaven, hoping to get a few gold coins out of this poor missionary. There's no indication that he was ever as affected in his heart as he was that first time he met with Paul in verse 25. But again and again, he sat and received personal teaching from the apostle. There's no record, no hint that he ever turned to God. In fact, his behavior only became worse as history records. He kept hardening his heart against the grace of God. Verse 27, after two years had passed, Portius Festus succeeded Felix. And because Felix wanted to do the Jews a favor, he left Paul in prison. Felix is playing a new game now. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Why did he want to do the Jews a favor? Well, here's why. A fight broke out in Caesarea between Jews and Greeks. And so in response, Felix sent in troops, authorized them to use deadly force, and thousands of Jews were slaughtered. He said, go in and deal with those Jews. And thousands of them died. And then Felix told the soldiers, ransack and loot the houses of the wealthiest Jews. And he did. They did. Now, after all of that died down, the Jewish community filed a grievance in Rome. And so Felix got that dreaded message. You have been recalled. You're gonna stand before the Caesar. Come right now. His sins were about to find him out. It turns out he barely escaped with his life thanks to the lobbying of his brother. Though he lived to cheat another day, it was not long after that he stood before a judge who could not be bought off, the judge of heaven. And for all that we know, Felix chose to enter the next life without Christ as his atonement, without Christ as his savior, without Christ as his advocate. And because of his refusal, he has eternal suffering in hell as his forever sentence. And that's not what God wanted for him. Look at all that God did to try to save this man. 
Look at the lengths God went to to give this guy chance after chance after chance, warning after warning, so much mercy, so much grace. Think about it. For two years, when Paul the apostle could have been going through Asia or Europe or getting to Spain like he wanted to do, when he could have been planting churches in countless cities, God decided it would be better to have him talk to this guy and his wife. Talk to this guy time and time again, year after year. We look at that and we're like, man, what a waste of time. But we see in this God's grace, not just generally, but that God in his grace actually loves individuals. He loves you. He loves individual sinners and knows them. He fashioned them in their mother's wombs. He knows everything about them. He's numbered the hairs on their head. He loves them so much. And so he was willing to stand at the door of Felix's heart and knock time and time again, but Felix would not open the door. His example shows us some of the lengths God will go to in order to reach out to people. Undeserving people, sure, we're all undeserving. But we see in Felix that God is not unkind. God is not unjust. His grace abounds. He wanted to save a person like Felix. He wanted to save a person like Drusilla, whose family had been so cruel and so awful to Jesus and his, his cousin and his followers. These are people that were cutting down Jesus's family members and his disciples. He says, I, I still wanna save them. I wanna save them. That's how much he loves. Some of those days must have been immensely frustrating for Paul to think about what he could be doing instead of preaching to this brick wall. But there are lessons there for Christians too. First of all, there's no one who's so bad that God doesn't love them. Felix was a terrible person, but God wanted him. He wanted to save him. He wanted to bring beauty from the ashes of his life. Second, there in verses 24 and 25, we see that flicker of spiritual activity in his heart. And it reminds us that even people who are completely immersed in wickedness still have a shot for salvation. Now, Felix didn't take it. He resisted the grace of God. But we saw those embers as the Holy Spirit worked on his heart and said, please, please turn from your sin. And we saw that little spark. He quenched it, he put it out. He said, I don't wanna have any part of that. But even somebody as awful as Felix, they're not too far gone. Think of the worst, most corrupt politician in the world today, don't say their names. <laughs> Maybe they're too far gone to respond to the gospel. Maybe they're in verse 27, right? They've rejected the gospel so many times that they are a brick wall. But maybe they're in verse 25. The Holy Spirit works even in the darkest of hearts. And we are also reminded that the gospel is authoritative. Felix may have held the keys to Paul's cell, but Paul held the keys to the kingdom. And the same is true of us today. We need not fear any man because we have the Lord with us. And he has sent us out with his living word to shine light in the darkness and cut to the heart of those trapped in their sin and show them the way out. Paul could speak with authority and confidence, and he did. He knew the truth. He knew the way to be saved. He didn't withhold it. He didn't try to manipulate. He didn't play any games. He offered this truth freely because freely we have received and so freely we give. So in the meantime, as you minister, don't lose hope. Don't be weighed down by frustration or discouragement. Be led by God. Trust that he knows the best use of us as we serve him. And if you're not a Christian here tonight, God loves you. He wants to save you. You are in a terrible, precarious, dangerous situation. You're gonna stand before your creator one day. And if you do not stand before him covered by the righteousness of Jesus, which was won on the cross at Calvary, you will be condemned to an eternity in hell. It's not because that's what God wants. The hell was created for the devil and his angels, not for you. But if you choose to spend your eternity there, God won't force you to do the right thing, but he's calling out, he's knocking on the door of your heart and he's saying, please, please believe and be saved. Call on the name of the Lord. Have your past dealt with, your present revolutionized, your future secured. That's what God wants for you. That's what we Christians want for you. And if there's anybody here who wants to know more about being a Christian, the room's full of Christians and you can talk to somebody with a smile on their face afterward. We don't want anything from you. We wanna tell you just how much Jesus has done for you that you might be saved.